So what I wanted to talk about today is the, the nature of seeking, the nature of finding, and the eternal nature of becoming. And I wanted to speak about the the, paradox, the inherent paradoxes in the spiritual process when we approach it with commitment. <clears throat> so first of all, I've always I've always stressed in my teaching work that um, that in order to succeed in the spiritual process. And notice what I just said. I said, in order to succeed in the spiritual process, which already implies quite a bit. And the reason I'm quite catching myself is because a lot of people are kind of engaged in a spiritual, pro a spiritual process, but um, don't necessarily intend to succeed. Don't necessarily even think that succeeding could be part of what, what a spiritual process is all about. And might not even have any idea what succeeding could possibly even mean. So just to begin, I want I want to put that into the mix. A lot of people are involved in all kinds of spiritual pursuits and practices of all kinds, experimenting with this and experimenting with that. But a lot of it's happening in a rather vague, undefined, uh, general psycho-spiritual context where the actual goal is not clearly delineated, it's not clearly defined, and where many people are attempting at different forms of self-improvement, but it's all in a vague context that makes the whole notion of progress in a larger process of spiritual development hard to, hard to, hard to define, hard to really get clear about. And um, I think it's important to have clear goals <laughs> in the spiritual process. It's important to be very goal oriented from my from my point of view. I've always been very spiritually ambitious from the very beginning. I was spiritually ambitious. From the age of 22, I was enlightenment, whatever that was, was my goal. And I was when I made up when I made up my mind to commit myself, it was enlightenment or bust. In other words, I was I didn't have plan B. There was no there was no plan B available to me in my own mind. I was going to succeed one way or the other. I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I was very goal oriented and I wanted to reach the goal. I wanted to glimpse what the Buddha had glimpsed, had experienced. I wanted to I wanted to know what he knew. I wanted to have a direct experience of what the greatest realizers described when they described their extraordinary higher states of consciousness and the miraculous adventures in consciousness. I, that's what I wanted to experience myself directly. And I also wanted to be free. I wanted to experience liberation. And I wanted to experience what unconditional liberation felt like. And I wanted to be happy. And I wanted to be free from the bondage of mental illness, neurosis, fear, anxiety, and confusion. I really wanted to break through to the other side, and what compelled me was the fact that uh, the fact that the, uh, that another side actually existed, because a big part of the path at the very beginning is actually believing that enlightenment is actually real. A lot of people hear about these extraordinary historical figures who apparently had these uh, these amazing metaphysical breakthroughs and experienced profound and remarkable degrees of human transformation that are that are historic, but most people don't really know what those experiences are and what they have to do with them. So, so believing in enlightenment, in other words, realizing that the profound transformations that some of the people like the Buddha spoke about are actually available to us, that they actually exist, even in the postmodern era, that these higher states of consciousness exist and they're available to us, and enlightenment exists and that it's real, and that the possibility of our own profound and miraculous liberation and emancipation and salvation is actually 
available, that it exists is a big part of getting started on the path, believing it, believing that enlightenment exists, or even better, having no doubt that enlightenment exists is a big part of getting started on the path in a, in a strong way. And a big part of the problem is, and it's nobody's fault, that many people, many, many of us are confused as to whether there is any ultimate non-relative or higher dimension to reality at all. A lot of people are very unclear whether there's any kind of ultimacy to be found in the reality of the human experience, the, the experience of essential life here on earth. That people don't know what ultimate actually means, what it could mean, whether there's, whether there's anything that's higher and that has any kind of reveals any kind of ultimate value and purpose upon its realization. So to use mythic language, we could say that um, many people are very confused as to whether the, whether this higher principle exists. So to use mythic language to say, well, I don't know if there's a God in this universe. <laughs> Understandably, many people don't know whether God exists. And when I use the word God, I'm using the word God to mean an ultimate principle, an ultimate metaphysical, absolute non-relative principle that um, defines ultimacy in its most radical and profound expression. So it's very difficult to seek for God what's called what's been called God realization. If you don't believe in God, <laughs> if you don't believe that the God principle actually exists in the universe, if you don't believe it exists, then it's hard to take it seriously as a valid pursuit. So the, so the first and most important part of the path is becoming convinced that there is an ultimate principle that's realizable in the universe the realization of which liberates us at the level of the soul and liberates us existentially and, existentially and profoundly at the level of the soul in a way that is irrevocable and is absolute and is permanent and it's forever. So that's, that's, the, that's the very challenging part of the beginning of the path is the belief or the conviction that there's something to find, there's something higher to find. And understandably, in a, in a relative postmodern context, uh, where culturally we are tend to be trapped in materialistic secular values, it's very understandable why many of us are so hesitant about whether this higher metaphysical principle exists at all and a lot of people struggle with with, with with an absence of any apparent sense of meaning or purpose in this life process because the, the thing that from my from my perspective the thing that makes this the discovery of this higher non-relative absolute god principle so absolutely relevant and so important is because in its discovery we we find an ultimate and absolute source of meaning. A meaning for our own existence or presence here in this barren, infinite universe. And that's very consoling. <laughs> when you realize that it means something to exist and it means something indescribably beautiful and inherently meaningful and profound to exist in this vast universe, it's very liberating. It, 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 it resolves the unbearable existential tension that so many sensitive, thoughtful, caring souls who are unsure about whether there's any inherent meaning in existence at all struggle with. Because unless we are sure that it means something inconceivably possible, positive to exist, unless we're sure about it, it's going to be very difficult for us to commit ourselves fully to the life experience. We might be half-baked in our commitment to our own life. Because if we're, if we're smart and we're not sure that life has any inherent meaning or purpose, and, and life exists in this very confusing context that's so 
often full of violence and pain and confusion. A lot of, as I said, sensitive people are not we're not sure whether whether life is good, whether whether it's it's worth even worth living. So that's that's the, those are some of the problems at the beginning of the path that we have to struggle with. Now, I had a very powerful spiritual initiation when I was 16 years old. Unexpectedly, I experienced a visitation from the absolute, which completely blew my socks off. And I suddenly realized that there was a higher principle that existed that was profound beyond measure, that was absolutely overwhelming in its radiant and inherent glory. I never experienced anything so magnificent in my life. And I knew I knew that in those few moments that I had this experience, that those few moments were more real than any other moments I'd ever experienced in my the 16 years that I'd been alive. Of that, I had no doubt. I knew that. And because of that, when I became a seeker when I was 22, because of that original experience, I knew that the God principle existed because the God principle had revealed itself to me for some reason. I don't understand why that happened, but it did. So I had no doubt that God existed, or the God principle existed, or that there was an ultimate truth to be known that, that had the power to liberate us. I had no doubt that this was true. I just I just didn't know how, how I was going to rediscover it. I didn't know how I was going to permanently re-realize it again. Because I knew without, without the confidence in that miracle, Life didn't seem so worthwhile. So one of the things that I've always stressed over the years that I've been a teacher, which is quite a while now, is that we should seek for God, for truth, for liberation, for enlightenment, for, lib for, our, liber for our salvation, for liberation, with a kind of passion and an intensity that will surely bring us to what the Buddha called the yonder shore, the solid ground of enlightened awareness, the solid ground of a stabilized state of liberation. So I've always loved the simple phrase, I think it comes from Jesus, seek until you find. Seek until you find what you're looking for. And once again, this refers to what I was saying at the beginning of my talk, because I've met so many people over the years who were seeking in some form or other, whether it was through prayer or meditation retreats or doing yoga or tantra or whatever, whatever it is that one does to seek for something higher. But as I said, I was saying earlier in my talk, a lot of, I knew a lot of people who were seeking, vaguely, generally seeking, but there was very few people I met who actually intended to find anything, or even had the expectation that they were going to find anything, I even had the expectation that they were going to come to the end of the search. And I always had that expectation. That's why I was seeking, was so that I'd come to the end of the search. The search, you know, the, the search, didn't, to me, this, this the seeking process of being on the search didn't have any value without trying to come to the end of the search. I didn't think the seeking had, had value in and of itself for its own sake. And I met so many people who were who spent years and hours and hours of their time doing spiritual practice very earnestly and diligently without necessarily intending to get anywhere permanent or even to reach enlightenment <laughs> or to achieve any kind of profound liberation. It seemed to be just faith in, in doing the practice, whatever it was, for its own sake. And that never worked for me. It never, to me, it just seemed meaningless. So, so seeking, to, in order to become a true seeker, to use the term true seeker, in order to become a true seeker, which means a serious seeker, a sincere seeker, an authentic seeker, means that you are serious about the spiritual path. This is not just something you do on weekends. It's something you just read books about and talk about at party. <laughs> parties. But it mean, it mean, it's, it's something that you feel very committed to. And it means you intend to succeed. 
because yeah, so you have to be willing, in order to become a true seeker, you have to be willing to allow yourself to become very vulnerable, open to the cosmos, open to the universe. It's like burying one's chest, burying one's soul, very vulnerably to the entire cosmos, asking to be seen, asking, asking for a sign, <laughs> asking the God principle for a sign that she exists, allowing yourself to become utterly and unimaginably vulnerable before the absolute principle. I'm begging, begging metaphorically or literally on one's knees for her to reveal herself, to relieve one's existential pain and suffering and doubt. Please reveal yourself to me, God principles, so I can be relieved of this terrible doubt that I struggle with every day, which tears my heart apart. Please, oh please, let me know that you exist and that this is not all in vain. That kind of thing. So it takes a lot of spirit, a lot of spiritual courage to allow yourself to become that vulnerable before your own higher, highest aspirations. And a lot of people are too egotistical and too proud, too arrogant, and too damn smart to let themselves be experience that kind of vulnerability. Now. I want to make very clear here that the that it's possible to find what you're looking for, that enlightenment exists, the God principle exists, God realization exists, it's available. Everything the great the greatest realizers in history have spoken about is real and it's available here and now. Anyone who's sincere enough and vulnerable enough to look, to dig deep enough. But the I just I just want to repeat as mundane as it might sound, that it's possible to find what you're looking for. Some people actually do. I did. And the difference between being a spiritual practitioner who's vaguely seeking versus a spiritual practitioner who's actually found what they're looking for is the difference between night and day. When you find what you're looking for, your life turns out, your life just becomes completely transformed. You become a different person. Because now you have realized that there's an absolute principle in this cosmos, inherent in this cosmos, the knowledge of which changes everything. Your soul undergoes a metaphysical revolution. It's impossible to describe in words, but it's bigger and more extraordinary than we can possibly imagine that it is. And once that happens, you are permanently changed doesn't mean you're not human, you're still human, you're still an imperfect human being, but you're an imperfect human being who knows the highest truth that exists in this universe at the level of the soul, once and for all and forever. And when this transformation happened to me in 1986, it, I went through a, a metaphysical transformational process that lasted about three weeks. And I felt like my cells were being transformed when I was undergoing this, this metaphysical ordeal. And when it was over, I was a different person. I wasn't the same person I had been. And the change has lasted all these years and it's as profound and powerful and as remarkable and extraordinary and profound as it was 30 years ago, 35 years ago. So being a finder, is a big deal. Not a lot of people can, can claim to be finding, but when you're a finder, you know it because something changes in your heart. Now you have no doubt that the God principle exists because the God principle has found you. You have found it, but it, more, more accurately, it has found you and blessed you and kissed you and loved you so intensely that you know you've been found and you don't have any doubt about it anymore. You don't have any doubt about it anymore. You don't have any doubt about it. Not having any doubt about it is what liberation is based upon. Because the absolute principle loves those who find her. Absolutely, unimaginably, beautifully, and intensely. So when you find when you have been found by her, 
it is the most exquisite experience it's possible to have. And what happens is that, is that existentially something comes to an end inside you, 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 you stop being trapped, you're not trapped anymore. You realize that existence, it's okay to exist and that it's good to exist. There is a metaphysical, existential, emotional, psychological release in the nervous system of your soul because you realize that everything is okay. And at the deepest and highest level, it's always been okay and it will always be okay in ways you can't understand with your mind. So you're no longer a beggar. <laughs> you're no longer a beggar, you're no longer a hungry ghost. You no longer struggle with doubt, with the spiritual doubt, existential doubt, because now you have spiritual conviction. You have spiritual conviction, what I like to call a spiritual self-confidence, because you you found it. She's found you, and you know it, and you don't have any doubt about it. And other people can feel it because it's true. You're not you're not lying. You're not pretending. It becomes obviously just it just feels obviously the case. And because you have become a finder, because she has found you, you've allowed yourself to be taken, so to speak. You no longer do you do all the emotional desperation in relationship to so many other issues in your life are gone. Because the most important thing that could ever happen in a human life has already happened to you. Everything else is gravy. <laughs> Everything else is extra because it's already done. And because it's already done, because you're because now because you're a true finder and it's already done, now you can get on with your life as a rich man or woman, as one of those, as the richest man or woman in the whole world, because you found the ultimate truth, the highest God principle, and everything else is extra. Now you now you can carry on with your life and unself. You can live your life unselfishly because you've been given everything that there is to receive. You become a very different kind of person living for very different reasons than most people live their lives. And once you once this has happened, um, you you begin to rest in the knowledge of what you found very naturally, effortlessly, spontaneously, and easily. It's no longer something vague that exists somewhere behind the, beyond the clouds, beyond the horizon that you can't see. You, you rest in the, in the perfect confidence that it's always the case. And you don't have any doubt. Now, interestingly enough, no matter what your relative experience may be from moment to moment, you have no doubt that it's always the case because your conviction has become so profound, because your experience has been so deep that you're sure. So all the existential desperation, emotional desperation is gone. And you can truly relax and be yourself fearlessly, courageously, and absolutely because you found everything there is to find. So even so, while it might, while in many circles it might not be fashionable to think to speak about <clears throat> and finding enlightenment and discovering enlightenment, it's the whole point. And as challenging as it may seem, as challenging as it is, we don't want to. We want to keep it. We want to keep it front and center because that's what it's all about. And of course, there's the famous Zen saying not to not to mistake the finger pointing for the moon the finger for the moon because the finger pointing to the moon is considered to be in the context in the zen context meditation and the moon is enlightenment if the, they say don't don't mistake the finger for the moon same thing so seek until you find I means seek until you come to the end of seeking and the only way to come to the end of seeking is to find what you're looking for it's very simple but in order to repeat, in order to find what you're looking for, you have to believe that it's, that number one, that it exists, that enlightenment exists, that the God principle exists. You have to believe that it, it exists, number one. And number two, that you that have the, the capability to actually find it. 
to have the key that you have the capability to find it, which means you need to have, you need to cultivate a reasonable degree of spiritual self confidence. You have to believe in your own spiritual worthiness. You have to feel worthy. To use mythic language of God, so to speak, you have to feel worthy of enlightenment. You have to believe in yourself, in your own inherent worth as an evolving soul. And, and, and you have to believe yeah, that's you become the source of your own self-respect and your own sense of dignity, that you're worth it. And you are deserving of this kind of experience. Nobody can do that for you. You have to you have this something you have to work out for yourself. You have to believe that you're worth it. If you don't have self-respect, this kind of experience won't will not be able to stabilize in your soul. With self-respect and a, a reasonable degree of self-respect and dignity is required here. So. And of course, coming to coming to the end of the path or becoming a finder is not the end of the spiritual life. But it means that you it means that you've come you, you, that you've got that you did it. <laughs> that you've did it, you, you've done the thing that needs to be done spiritually. And you know, you've, you've become, as I said before, one of the richest people in the universe. But if you're lucky, if you're lucky, and I've been the most lucky, I'm the luckiest person that I know. If you're lucky, this kind of event will happen to you when you're fairly young, so you can live the truth of what you found for the rest of your days, so that the rest of your human experience can, can become an expression of the most extraordinary thing that exists in the universe. So you can become an expression of that. You can become an expression of that. You can vibrate with that, transmit that, be an audacious, outrageous, confronting expression of the highest principle in the universe in human form. You might lose a few friends, but who cares? Because you'll be free and you won't mind. So remember that once you become a finder, once enlightenment has occurred, if it has, human experience is not over, it, it, it continues, but now it continues in a different form. A different, your, your, your humanity expresses itself in a different way now, because you're a different person. You're a different person at the level of the soul, your raison d'etre to exist has changed. You're no longer separate from the whole universe. You're no, you don't go, you're not, you're no longer lost in your own neurotic, narcissistic story, thank God. But now you're, you're here living only to be an expression of the highest. At least that's what you would aspire to. <clears throat> and your purpose for, to exist is to express that and that alone. That becomes your obsession. becomes your reason to exist. So you're no longer like everybody else. You're not trying to fit in anymore. You're not, you're not, you're not losing yourself in other people's minds and thoughts because you found your very own self. So life goes on, but now you're living life for very different reasons, and that's the whole point. Now your life is to become an expression of liberation and beauty and dignity. And your life should, in a, should in a very natural and spontaneous way, express the fact that there's inherent meaning in the fact that the universe exists, and that meaning should be something that's transmitted through you and by you naturally and unselfconsciously and easily and obviously. Now, there's different ways to look philosophically at the metaphysical position of being a finder. Some people, some traditions and some people feel that once you become a finder, there's nothing left to do because, you, because it's already happened. Whereas there's other people like me who think there's everything to do. Now you have so much more to do because you've become a finder. Now you have a lot to do.
And there's another way to look at all this, which is the what I wanted to contrast everything I was just describing, which is that the human incarnation at higher levels provides us with an opportunity for growth. That a conscious person, someone who's becoming truly conscious of the human experience in larger and larger contexts, eventually we'll discover that the context in which we exist is a, is a developmental one, it's an evolutionary one. Life, it's life itself is a developmental, is part of a developmental process. It's in progress. That the whole universe and everything in it, including life itself, is in a process of becoming more and more and more of what it can be. We recognize when we when we awaken to the evolutionary impulse, the evolutionary principle in the universe, we realize that the that there's an impulse, there's, there's an evolutionary impulse in this universe that is expressing itself in so many different ways that the universe is trying to become more of what it can be. It's reaching and striving for greater complexity and greater good truth and good truth and beauty, goodness, truth and beauty. The universe is aspiring to become more of what it can be. The universe is aspiring to become more of what it can be through all of us. And someone who becomes conscious you know, someone who awakens to the evolutionary principle in the cosmos begins to feel this movement of the cosmos uh, vibrating in their own body, mind, and soul. You can feel the vibration of the universe's urge to become more of what it can be, feeling itself through us. And this is experience as the urge to grow, the urge to develop, the urge to realize, make manifest the infinite potential that we glimpse exists within us and all around us. So there's the awakening to this, to this, to the consciousness of the urge to become inherent in the creative process. This is what, this is what I call awakening to the evolutionary impulse, or the urge to evolve that's driving the whole cosmos. <clears throat> And when we when we experience it, we 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 feel the hunger to become everything that we're capable of becoming. It's a, it's a, it's a very healthy and ecstatically driven desire to to become more of what we can be, to grow, to make manifest the infinite potential that we realize is inherent within us, and. And for those who are truly serious about this kind of endeavor, find themselves feeling very inspired by the recognition that the developmental process, the urge to become that's inherent in the fabric of the cosmos, seems to be an infinite aspiration that's coming from the heart of creation itself. But the urge to become is an infinite aspiration. Think about that. The urge to become is an infinite aspiration. And the fact that it's an infinite aspiration, and we can feel the infinite nature of that aspiration, it means it's a kind of enlightenment also. But in this kind of enlightenment, the, the, because the, the aspiration is infinite, is you can't come to the end of it. There's no... You can't come to the end of it because it's an infinite aspiration. You can only infinitely embrace or engage that aspiration eternally for eternity if you have the courage to do that. But it, you, it's not like seeking itself. It's not, it's not like the seeking I was just describing where you can come to the end of seeking. If you, if you dare to embrace the infinite aspiration arising from the heart of the cosmos, to become, then you have to have the courage to embrace the infinite nature of the aspiration itself, which means that it's a for, it's a forever aspiration. I aspire to become eternally for eternity, 
to consciously evolve, to consciously become eternally for eternity. Without end. <laughs> and it's the without end part that, that uh, the ego has a little bit of trouble with. We seem to be interested in that which is eternal, except when, it, except when we have to say yes to it. <laughs> and then a lot of us aren't so sure that we want to be eternally engaged in the, create, in, the, in the becoming of the cosmos. I can't think of anything more interesting we could possibly be doing, but that's another conversation. But the, the urge to become, the creative impulse that inspires in us the desire to grow and to become to give rise to what's possible relentlessly as I've, as, I've, as I've just been saying is an eternal aspiration and so what's very interesting is that this is the point of what I wanted to talk about is that it's possible to find what you're looking for to awaken to the God principle, to awaken to enlightened awareness, to become a finder, and to have landed on the yonder shore permanently, once and for all and absolutely, once and for all and forever, to take up residence on the yonder shore, like few people have ever done before. And, and, and at the same time, embrace this eternal aspiration to become that's vibrating from the heart of the cosmos and to engage in this eternal process of becoming from the perspective of being a finder. But there's no contradiction between finding the highest and the finding that which is the highest, the most extraordinary and profound truth that exists in all, in all of the totality of reality and still to aspire to consciously engage in the co-creation of the entire of the interior of the cosmos eternally for eternity. So finding doesn't in, in the in the way I'm describing it, finding does not necessarily imply the end. It could it could it implies it implies the fact that one is now on solid ground, solid metaphysical ground. From that solid metaphysical ground, the potential, the creative potential, from then to eternity is infinite. And what they're teaching this is this is this it's this uh, apparent paradox that the teaching of evolutionary enlightenment points to very precisely and very clearly. We want to we want to we want to seek until we find. The God principle, enlightenment. We want to come to the end of the search so that we can experience liberation, we can become liberated, so that we can then be free to fully engage with the evolutionary process eternally for eternity. That's the, the idea. Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> I can't think of anything better to do. Because the thing is, the coming to the end of the search for enlightenment for the God principle makes us available to the cosmos. Most of us, unless, unless you can actually awaken to enlightened awareness in a profound and permanent way, you're not going to be available for the God principle or for the enlightenment. Because you'll be busy with your mind and with your ego, with your narcissistic absorption. You'd be busy with your ego's narrative. You won't be available for the universe. You'll be busy in, your, in the small world as a small self for countless lifetimes. It's kind of how it works, as far as I understand. <laughs> as my guru was fond of repeating, as nirvana has no beginning and no end, so samsara has no beginning and no end, so. At a certain point in, the, in our seeking process and in our spiritual practice, we want to realize that 
hell, the hell, the hell of the state of unenlightenment. It's an eternal hell realm from the perspective of the awakened mind. And once you wake up from that eternal hell realm, you want to stay out of it forever. And I'll be busy with the nirvanic aspirations that I was describing a few minutes ago. So we want to seek until we find. Then finding doesn't become an end in itself. It becomes a means to a much higher end, which so we can be available for the cosmos, truly available, available at the level of our souls. And that's the whole point. I know some of you might find it hard to understand what I'm saying, but I there's a world of difference between being interested in these metaphysical potentials and understanding what it means to be truly available for the universe. If you're truly available for the universe, it means you have put aside a lot of your other karmic entanglements, <laughs> which can last for eons of time, as we know. You've, you've transcended a lot of your egoic entanglements. You now have start surrendering to surrendering literally to a higher calling, and when you surrender to a higher calling, you experience unimaginable freedom because you've gotten out of the mess that samsara is, out of the eternal mess that samsara is. And now you have other work to do, which will probably demand everything you've got and a lot more than that. That'll be in the context of liberation from the very beginning. Once you become a finder. Everything else is liberation from the very beginning, no matter what kind of complexity that you're involved in. Liberation is the ground and the foundation of the reality in which you're living, in which you're engaging with life. So it's very difficult to, to engage in the evolutionary process sincerely, earnestly, while still being entangled in unenlightenment. Because the, because the reason is the unenlightened state of mind, state of being, state of the soul will keep on pulling your attention back down to hell. <laughs> That's what it does. When you're, you're, when you're, the minute when you find yourself contemplating these profound metaphysical potentials that exist in this amazing universe, you'll find your mind getting distracted by all these com complications and complexities that emerge in hell. And then you fall down. For this kind of process to work, you have to be able to keep your attention focused on nirvana and what's possible in the, in the nirvanic realm and in the nirvanic context. This is way beyond what most people ever begin to imagine. But it's extraordinary, profound, and miraculous. And in order to understand what I'm saying, we need to step out of samsara absolutely, totally, and completely, once and for all and forever. We need to lift ourselves up and out and take up resonance. <laughs> in a nirvana context, and then we want to build from that platform. So it's a completely different world that I'm talking about. So then the, the point of what I'm saying is that from in a context of, of the profound liberation being the ground of our experience, or having become the ground of our experience, we can engage in, in the eternal process of conscious evolution. And what could be more beautiful, profound, and extraordinary than that? I don't think anything. So remember, we want to stop thinking about liberation, enlightenment, and the evolution of the interior of the cosmos from the perspective of the unenlightened ego. Because the unenlightened ego may understand it intellectually, but metaphysically, it'll just never really get what it's all about. Because there's too much loss in the spider's, spider's well, web of hell.
So, I think I said most of what I intended to say. And I think I said a few things I didn't intend to say, which is part of the fun. <laughs> and remember to seek until you find. Don't seek without the intention to find, because it's a waste of time, I think. Seek with the intention to find. And the reason in this, what I believe high, is uh, in this highest context is you want to become a finder, not as an end in itself, but as a means to a higher end so you can be available to the cosmos itself, so you can be truly available for to liberate and cultivate the nirvanic, the nirvanic potential that exists in these higher states and higher stages of human development. And the liberation part is a must. It's the foundation of getting your ego out of the way. If we don't all do the work to get our ego out of the way, the ego is going to mess it all up, and it always does. If we don't take special care and special attention to make sure that it doesn't ruin the spiritual project altogether, which it usually does for most people and groups of people. So getting the ego out of the way is an absolute prerequisite for any hopes for success. And the first question, Andrew, is from Marilyn. She is asking, isn't there a tension paradox between the resting in the already existing wholeness of our being and letting life cosmos flow through us, which means surrender, versus striving to become, which seems a denial and lack of acceptance of our already existing wholeness? Well, there, there... It's a reasonable, it's a good question, but there's no Ted, there's no tension between them because it's not because the because the urge towards I to the urge to give rise to higher potentials and greater complexity, greater depth, and <clears throat> is coming from the is coming from the energy and intelligence that created the universe itself. It's coming from the evolutionary impulse itself. So. I always ask everybody, who created the universe? Yeah, there's, there's an absolute principle, a God principle. The, sum to, the, the God principle is the sum totality of reality as a metaphysical vibration. So if, we, if it makes sense to us that this And in fact, from, a, from an enlightenment perspective, or from, from the perspective of the awakened realization that the universe has an inside and, a, and an outside, and the inside of the universe is an, inter is an interior dimension of sentience and subjectivity, it can awaken to itself. So from the perspective of the awakened interiority of the whole cosmos, if you realize that this urge towards greater potential is coming from the God principle itself, which is the energy and intelligence that created the universe in the first place and it's creating it right now, there's no tension because it seems that miraculously, ecstatically, profoundly, and uh, completely that the God principle is aspiring to her own, to liberate her own greater potential through us. And this is why uh, Marilyn, I say in my teaching that the, uh, that the ultimate, that the sum totality of all of reality, I, 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 ask, I ask people, what is the nature of God of the absolute principle? I say the, the nature of God of the absolute principle is the sum totality of all of reality. The sum totality of all of reality is both being and becoming, which means the God principle, which is the sum totality of all of reality, is both being and becoming. So therefore, the God principle 
the sum totality of reality as being is always resting in her own nature as being. So from the perspective of being, which is an aspect of the sum totality of all of reality, there's no urge to become. And there's only stillness and peace. But from the perspective of the sum totality of reality, which is the becoming, the, 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 the interior of the universe is ever striving to become more of what it can be, which is also the very same God principle that's resting in being. So the God principle has the urge to become as the creative impulse to, 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 that gives rise to the evolutionary process is ever striving for more, for greater, to give rise to greater potential naturally, spontaneously, effortlessly, and ecstatically. So from, from, from an ultimate perspective of non-duality being and becoming a one and not two, from the ultimate perspective of non-duality being and becoming a one and not two, and yet being and becoming are simultaneously, they're not separate and simultaneously, they're also an absolute paradox. So, no tension, no problem. Being is never disturbed by becoming. And becoming is never slowed down by being. <laughs> They're both simultaneously the absolute, vibrating and shining brightly in all her, in his or her radiance. So there's no contradiction it's a paradox, but there's no contradiction because they're both the absolute in all, yeah, it's beauty. So that's why in this, in this teaching of evolutionary enlightenment, I always emphasize the necessity to awaken to the, this absolute principle as both being and becoming at the level of felt experience. And when we awaken to being, at the level of felt experience, we the, the experience of being is peace. That peace that passes all understanding, which is no urge to become anything or anyone for any reason. There's only resting in being, and emptiness and nothingness, and the peace of the unmanifest, the uncreated, the unborn, and the unimaginable freedom and release that there always is there. So that's, that's a felt, that can be a felt experience for someone who has this deep realization of the nature of being. And simultaneously, when we, when we wake into the becoming, the, the, the God principle is the urge to become. We experience the profound nature of the ecstatic urgency of the urge to become, and the, ecstatic, the, the vibration of the ecstatic urgency of the urge to become is the, the, the God's desire to become when what you can be. Is, is experienced in a state, in a wave of ecstasy. The urge to become is, is an ecstatic compulsion. It's an unimaginably ecstatically, purely positive ecstatic compulsion to give rise to the possible. There's no tension in it. One is utterly undone by the ecstatic nature of the urgency itself. So it's only a feeling of the, of the liberation of greater potential. So there's no tension inherent in it. And the urge to become as an expression of the God principle as Eros that I'm describing is a moving train. It's always, it's a train that's always moving. And the point, is the, the, the big point they make in this teaching is that God is both being and becoming simultaneously, miraculously, inconceivably. In the context of non-duality, in which being and becoming one and not two, there's no problem, there's no contradiction. There's only a, a miraculous, inconceivable paradox that is amazing. When you realize that God is the absolute principle of the sum totality of all reality, uh, is one and two at the same time. And that's amazing.
Now there are some people who realize who um, realize we're awakened to the absolute as as only being. Don't, don't realize we're awakened to the absolute as becoming. Can we give priority to being. This would be more in the form of what I call the traditional enlightenment, the traditional Buddhist enlightenment, or the Vedantic enlightenment. And there's some evolutionary realizers who awaken profoundly to the evolutionary impulse and the urge to become, but have not done it, or don't realize or have not awakened to the nature of the absolute as, 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 as being itself. And I'm saying in this teaching that they're both two sides of one, two sides of the same coin. God is both being and becoming, and there's no difference between them at the level of the absolute. Relatively speaking, they're completely opposite. And at the absolute level, they merge and become one and the same. And then you can then you can make sense out of the the, the, the metaphysical complexity and the way this you know, how it simplifies matters way in which we can make sense out of it. And this relates very much to, 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 to tangible felt experiences that we can have as human beings. In other words, what I'm saying is not just abstract metaphysics, but uh, exper experiential feelings and knowings and insights and intuitions that are available to all of us. And if you have these kinds of feelings and uh, insights and these vibrations, <laughs> reveal themselves inside you, you will suddenly say, oh, what Andrew was talking about is actually real. He's not just, this is not just metaphysical garbage, garble. He's talking about real states of consciousness that have particular qualities. What he said, this is actually real. What he's talking about is real, tangible. This exists. Now I understand. Okay, Marilyn. Yes, sir. I wanted to say thank you for expounding on that because um, I tell me if I'm getting it. Um, I applied the word striving to becoming, and that seems an invitation to the ego to come in. What you're saying, it, what I'm hearing is surrender applies to both being and becoming. Surrender to being part of the evolution of the cosmos. I love it. Whatever it's being and becoming, be a part of that and surrender to it. I think we just, you, you said it very beautifully. And I want to ask you a question. Do, do, have you ever had the experience when, the, when the, there's an ecstatic compulsion and the nature of the ecstasy makes it impossible to resist? So one cannot help but surrender? Uh, yeah, not real often. <laughs> But yeah, it comes up. But I I like the fact that you switched my perspective on the notion of being and becoming. They're one and the same if you view the absolute in a certain way. And I think I'm hearing you right. I appreciate the ex, uh, your further explication of that. Yeah, you just see them as two sides of the same coin. Yeah. And see it as being an absolute paradox. Yeah, thank you for that. It's helpful to me. Thanks. Thank you. I have no other questions right now. So that's nice. Don't get, quiet, don't get to sit quietly, but yippee. <laughs> hmm? Don't get to sit quietly. If a talk is really at the highest level, then everybody gets to transcend their mind for a few minutes. And then the, then the, the place where the questions come from kind of is transcended. And then all one can do is rest in being, which is a gift. It's called the questionless state. What I think can be helpful to everybody is the is contemplating, is the is the is the meditative contemplation of what I was just speaking to Marilyn about, which is the fact that being and becoming are one and not two. So at a relative level, 
there's an absolute distinction between being and becoming they're polar opposites but at an at the at a relative level but an absolute at an absolute level they're, they're, they're one and not two so contemplating that this the contemplating being and becoming as a singularity the non-dual singularity which at a relative level is is uh is a total paradox and an absolute level is not, can uh, reveal, directly reveal the nature of enlightened awareness to you. If you realize that being and becoming are, par are an absolute paradox at one level and at a higher level are one and the same, and this, and this makes sense to you transrationally, and you're getting it. That's when you begin to see and feel the, the nature of non-duality or the, the one that is that, that appears to be two. <laughs> so when you can see that which appears to be two, but, you, but you're feeling it as not as one, that's very good. And you, that, that, that's transrational knowledge of the highest truth of oneness. And I think it's it's important to, to have these kind of contemplative moments because I felt for a long time that too many people kind of assume assume that all is one and speak about it a little bit too casually and, and kind of a little bit too cavalier about yeah all all is one without actually really having the experience of what it actually means. Because when you have the experience of what it actually means, the metaphysical experience of what it actually means, it's profoundly liberating. And you begin to see, feel, and know the universe in higher and deeper ways than most people could imagine. And that's the whole point. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. I appreciate your kind attention. and. Sympathetic interest, interest in the miracle of enlightenment.